Hi, everyone. This is Denise Wilson. I'm going to be your host uh, today for the Association for Healthcare Denial and Appeal Management's Wednesday webinar on legal arguments for clinical appeals. Um, We've got the call-in number there, or you can also listen with your speakers. Um, either way, for the audio, this is being recorded, and we will have the recording of the presentation up on our website within usually about a week um, or less than that. If you're new to go to webinar, you should have a control panel on your screen that allows you to choose whether you want to use your computer audio or your telephone to um, listen. You can also download the handouts there. Go to the um, option that says handouts and you can download our handouts there. You can also go to our website at www.ahdam.org and I pasted the, the handouts um, for today's presentation on our landing page. Okay, so our, our main page when you log in not log in, you don't have to log in to get them. Just go to the website, they're on the main page. And it's in red, it says uh, download handouts, I think is what I put on there, um, right above the uh, information about today's presentation. So I know sometimes you're, you're at work, a lot of you are at work right now and your um, computers will not allow pop-ups to occur. So if you can't download them from GoToWebinar, go to our uh, webpage and you can download them from there. Uh, we're going to go for about 45 minutes, um, 50 minutes today, and then leave the last few minutes open for questions. So if you have questions um, as we go along about the content, go ahead and type them in and we will do the best we can to try to answer them at the end of the time today. Also, if you're having problems with audio, um, uh, video, you know, handouts or anything else, technical issues, you can put that in there as well. We have Alice here today assisting us with um, answering those questions from you guys if you're having technical problems. Okay, the CEUs are contact hours. Um, they, we do grant CEUs to our ADAM members only. So you need to be an ADAM member as of midnight tonight is usually what I say. So if you wanna sign up afterwards, you can and we'll still offer you the CEUs. Free CEUs if you're an ADAM member, no CEUs at all if you're not an ADAM member. And you have to get uh, attend this live webinar for at least 50 minutes. So make sure you stay on till the end so you get your full 50 minutes in there. Complete a survey is going to pop up automatically for you at the end of the webinar. Uh, we will email the CEU certificates to you. It takes us about a week to get those out because we do check that you attended, that you filled out the survey, that you're a member, all that good stuff. If you're watching this as a recording of the live webinar, we don't offer CEUs for watching the recording. And there are no individuals in a position to control content for this activity that have any relevant financial relationships to declare. The CEUs that we offer, you will be prompted on the survey to select the CEUs that you're interested in, and you can select as many as you want. So we offer CEUs from Actus, NARI, um, CCMC, which will be for our case managers, AHIMA, and also ANCC for our nurses. Now, there was a hiccup with the um, AHIMA sort of, uh, CEU, and it is pending, so there was a little bit of delay in getting that one. I fully expect that they will retrospectively approve a CEU for AHIMA, but we just had it, there was just a little glitch with their website, and so I don't have that one yet. It's been um, submitted. Go ahead, if you want an AHIMA CEU, go ahead and mark it. And uh, once that does get approved, and I, I'm pretty certain it will, but not no guarantee it will get approved, we'll send those out to you. So that's what's going on with the HEMA CEUs. Our next complimentary webinar um, is going to be pra best practices in the appeals process. Now, the last webinar we did, I announced we were going to do clinical validation in September. We've had to reschedule that one. We're going to do it a little bit later in the year. I'm not sure yet if it's going to be in November or December. And we're going to do best practices in the appeals process. We had a lot of people ask on the last webinar about um, you know, what, what's the best practice for second level appeals, third level of appeals, 
um, you know, just moving through that appeals process, what are some of the some of the uh, best practices? How do you adjust your arguments and things like that? So we'll talk about that in when, on Wednesday, September 21st. Uh, again, it's used for Adam members, and you can register for that now um, on our homepage at www.ahdam.org. So that's open for registration. Okay, a little bit about ourselves, uh, about the association. It's the nation's only association dedicated to healthcare denial and pill management. We really created this association to educate, um, network, provide support, provide recognition and validity to the work that we do in denial and appeal management. And our mission is to support promote professionals like yourselves who work in this field and also um, to create, our vision is to create an even playing field where patients and healthcare providers can be successful in persuading uh, insurers to pay appropriately. And I've been seeing that a lot more lately um, on LinkedIn and some other websites and other um, you know, listservs and things that I belong to where people, where we're talking more and more about creating that even playing field. So we're all playing by the same rules. Okay, a little bit about myself. I'm Senior Vice President. Um, I, I should have updated that. Denial Research Group is now called Pair Watch. Um, and Appeal Masters, and I'm also president of the association. I've been in healthcare for over 30 years. I've been doing appeal work for about uh, 17 years now, 18 years now, uh, and I do, these days I do a lot of education, a lot of speaking, um, and a lot of uh, presentations, uh, webinars, and things like that, just getting the word out about some good appeal writing strategies and, and methodologies and processes so that uh, we can all be successful. Our presenter today, so I get to sit back and listen, um, is Bill Haynes, and he serves as the legal director of the clinical legal unit and as managing attorney attorney for um, Denial Research Group, now called uh, Payer Watch Appeal Masters. And Bill is a member in good standing of the Maryland Bar. He's a member of, this, of the association and a, Mer a member of the American Health Law Association. He has experience in healthcare law, including managed care, contract analysis, payer provider arbitrations, and independent review process. He personally manages a team of attorneys who do legal research, answer legal questions, and draft language for Medicare, managed Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial appeal cases, independent reviews, and arbitrations. The Association for Healthcare Denial and Appeal Management publishes and distributes materials on its website that are created by our members or invite industry subject matter experts for the benefit of our ADAM members. We do not certify the accuracy or authority of the materials. Materials are distributed and presented as research information to be used by our members in conjunction with other research deemed necessary in the exercise of your independent professional judgment. Adam claims no liability in relation to reliance on the content of these materials. The views expressed in the materials are the views of the materials authors and do not necessarily represent the views of Adam. Any references are provided for informational purposes only, do not constitute endorsement of any sources. There are no conflicts of interest to declare for any individual in a position to control the content of this presentation. Okay, and then we have an additional legal disclaimer um, for Bill today because he is an attorney that this presentation is for informational and educational purposes only. The information contained in this presentation does not constitute legal advice, is not intended to create an attorney-client relationship. If you need legal advice, contact your own attorney. Okay, our learning objectives. There's a lot to get through, isn't there, at the beginning of these things? Um, at the conclusion of the webinar, you'll be able to describe the purpose of including legal arguments in clinical appeals, identify the agency in your state that sets legal re regulations for medical insurance, and Bill's going to talk a lot more, not so much about the agency in your state, he's going to mention that, but he really has um, kind of, um, not, I don't know, beefed up it's the right word, but expanded um, this topic to talk about jurisdictions, which it, is probably more relevant to our um, discussion today. So he's going to talk a lot about what jurisdiction um, plays a part in the different uh, regulations and, and things that we use in our appeals. And then learning how to match up at least one legal argument with appropriate circumstance for use. Okay, I'm not going to go through these for the nurses. Um, they're the same 
uh, outcomes or objectives, um, but uh, nursing just asks that we write them a little bit differently, that we have a learning outcome, and then we also have objectives written in a little bit different language um, for their purposes. All right, so let me pass um, control over to Bill, and I'm going to let you take that from here. Okay. All right. You should be good to go. I'm not seeing it move. Okay, did you click on your, uh, just click on the screen? Yeah, it's still just showing the, uh, the first slide. Okay. Let me try making you a presenter and see if that, did that change? Uh, yes, but now the, uh, the screen is gone. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Let me change it back to you. Okay. Do you have your presentation? There it is. Oh, did you find it? I was going to say, if you have it, I can move the slides for you if you just want to. Okay. okay. Looks like we got it. Let me just, I apologize, people. Let me just make sure I can control this. There we go. Okay, so sorry about that. Well, let's wow. get started. <laughs> so the purpose of including legal arguments in your appeals, why would you want to do this? I mean, these are legal arguments. You're not an attorney. This is all very boring. Why would you do this in the first place? So the reason is because uh, these, these legal arguments will make your appeal stronger. They'll make it more likely to succeed. Uh, it shows that you understand your rights and that you understand the payer's responsibilities under your both your contract and the laws that govern uh, your relationship and this entire area of the economy. It lets the payer know that their denial is not just a factual disagreement, but an illegal action. Uh, it telegraphs expectations that the payer will follow the specific insurance laws and regulations that govern them. It conveys the idea that not just that you should be paid, but that you must be paid. Uh, now, let me be very clear about this. When you're saying somebody's doing an illegal action, that is done to strengthen the argument. This is not you accusing somebody of a crime. This is not something that if you include these arguments and they don't work out, you or your organization could be sued for defamation. That's not how this works. Uh, you know, you're, the idea is you're including legal arguments that have been vetted for their validity. And as long as your, uh, the staff involved are trained to make sure they pick the right arguments, uh, there shouldn't be any issue. Even if they accidentally pick like the wrong one and it doesn't work out, the worst thing that will happen is that it won't work out. And if you eventually take this particular case or even several of these cases in front of somebody with legal authority, like a judge or something, the worst that would happen is, is they'll say, no, that doesn't apply in this case, and then move on. So don't let the term illegal action frighten you. Uh, the purpose of this is to really strengthen the clinical argument, to make it more than just, as I said, a factual disagreement, and to make it clear to the payer that they're violating laws, they're violating your contract. In addition to that, uh, if you do decide, if your organization is pursuing uh, what we call their full legal rights under your contract, which includes, and the laws, which includes being able to go to dispute resolution, uh, which here I'm talking about things both inside and outside the contract that are beyond the internal appeals process uh, that the payer allows. So this includes independent review that may be allowed by the statutes that control that particular plan, uh, or it may be allowed by certain state um, mechanisms uh, for certain plans that they're allowed to regulate. Uh, mediation, oh, that's that shouldn't be medication, that should be mediation, uh, and arbitration, uh, or even litigation. Uh, what these, including these arguments at 
as soon as you can, if, if possible, from the beginning of the claim, it helps strengthen the record of the claim. Now, you, you're allowed to bring in legal arguments generally at whatever stage uh, that you're going to, uh, but it makes it stronger if you can go, if you go to an independent reviewer or a mediator or an arbitrator, and if you can show them in the record that these arguments were brought up early on, uh, and that the payer either didn't address them or addressed them with bad evidence or weak evidence. It gives, it makes your case that much stronger to show that the record reflects uh, that your arguments have been there from the beginning and that the payer has not adequately addressed them from the beginning. So let's move on to the next slide. So the types of legal arguments, I'm breaking these down into uh, four broad categories. There are certainly more types of legal arguments than what I'm talking about, but for the purposes of what you would include in clinical appeals, uh, these four broad categories should cover pretty much everything. Uh, so first, regulatory arguments. These are based on the regulations and guidances created by state and federal regulatory agencies uh, that control health insurance and how it works uh, in America as a whole and in specific states. Uh, an example of this here, this is a Medicare Advantage regulation, 42 CFR section 422.113. It's about the requirement of coverage for ambulance services, emergency and urgently needed services, uh, maintenance and post-stabilization care services for Medicare Advantage plans. So if you're if you have an argument that says the payer uh, didn't cover these when they were required to, that would be a regulatory argument. Um, this, I think, is a good place to, to talk briefly about the state regulatory agencies. Uh, the reason I'm not going into like whole slides about it is that honestly, if you don't already know about your state regulatory agencies, it is not difficult to find out which agencies regulate uh, health insurance in your state. Uh, just very brief um, internet research should be able to find you that. Just look up the state department of insurance and that will take you, that will take you there nine times out of 10. Now it might not be called that, but even just looking up department of insurance, it should take you to the right agency, even if the agency isn't technically called such and such states department of insurance. Uh, in Tennessee, for example, it's called the Tennessee Department of Commerce and Insurance. Uh, in New York, it's called the Department of Financial Services. Uh, in Maryland, where everything is boring, it's called the Insurance Administration. So uh, just keep in mind that it might not be called that, but if you just look up State Department of Insurance, you should be able to find it very easily. And then it's a matter of simply uh, perusing that agency's website, reading their literature, and maybe talking to their agents just to make sure you have an idea of what that agency covers and what processes it has. Because it is in those processes uh, that they have available to providers where you will use uh, your arguments, including these legal arguments that we think you should use. So then you have statutory arguments. Statutory arguments are based on laws and statutes passed by the government, uh, either the state government or the federal government. So this is usually passed by the legislature and then approved by the executive, sometimes, uh, over, sometimes just by the legislature overriding a veto by the executive. An example of this is, here's 29 USCA 1185 standards relating to benefits for mothers and newborns. This is part of the Newborns Act. Uh, which was a law that requires a certain amount of coverage for a length of stay for both a mother and a newborn uh, after the birth occurs. There's a minimum uh, hours requirement uh, that insurance must cover. Uh, and so uh, if, you're, if you have an argument saying that the payer didn't uh, cover the minimum requirements, then that's a statutory argument. Okay, here's the other two types of legal arguments. Contractual is pretty straightforward. This is based on the terms of a contract between parties. Uh, those terms can be implied by law, so they don't necessarily have to be written in there. Most of the time you're gonna be making uh, arguments based on explicit terms, 
but implied terms can be used. And I will come back to this because the example argument I'm going to use later, uh, which I think is one that is very useful because it is very broadly applicable, is an implied term. So an example of an explicit term uh, in your in the or in the pair provider contracts that your organization has, it's prob this it probably you probably have a term like this, but it's probably a bit longer. But this is just example language. So payer agrees to pay provider for covered services in accordance with state or federal laws or regulations and the terms of this agreement. So an argument based on the violation of this term in the contract would be a contractual argument. And then common law. This is based on a court system's case law. Uh, this is something that people who don't regularly interact with the law and don't have uh, some kind of legal education don't necessarily realize, but the court system is actually very heavily involved in the creation of law and has been for hundreds of years. It's just what we call common law. Uh, and common law are the doctrines and interpretations established by precedent and case law uh, going back decades and sometimes centuries. Uh, that is all considered perfectly valid law. Uh, and if you use it, an example of this is the common law doctrine of unjust enrichment. Uh, every jurisdiction in the United States has this as a common law doctrine. They interpret it slightly differently from place to place, but it is broadly speaking very similar. The concept goes back, this is one of those that goes back centuries back into English law. Uh, but if you are accusing somebody of uh, perhaps a payer of uh, being unjustly enriched by the denial of a claim, that would be an example of a common law argument. Um, so, jurisdiction. This is something, so in addition to when you're implementing uh, the idea of putting legal arguments into your clinical appeals, one of the things you'll need to train people about is about the different types of, of arguments that'll be used. Uh, the other thing that needs to be known about, and this is not so complicated that people who aren't attorneys can't learn it, but it does need to be something that's uh, spelled out. And I'll and at the near the end of the presentation, I'll talk more about uh, the the ways that one would go about developing these trainings um, and how to supplement them so that you don't have a lot of mistakes for these areas. One of the things that needs to be thought about is jurisdiction, because if you have a set of legal arguments, those would be based on different states' laws or different uh, federal laws and regulations. So when do you apply them? Uh, different, different healthcare plans are regulated in different ways. I'm sure many of you know that. Some plans are only able to be regulated by the federal government whereas others are only regulated by state governments, and many are actually covered by both. So this is, so an understanding of jurisdiction, again, you don't need a lawyer's understanding of jurisdiction, but you do need some understanding of jurisdiction to give you an idea of when to use certain types of legal arguments. Uh, and these come from the patient's plan, uh, the choice of law clause in a contract, or even the physical location of the treatment. And I'll go through those. So for example, the patient's plan, if it's traditional Medicare, only federal law applies. You know, Medicare, as, as I'm sure you all know, is an exclusively federal program, so only federal law matters. Medicare Advantage, though, is a type of managed Medicare, which means there is an intermediary of a private payer who has a contract with you. So federal law applies to those plans, but your contract is still governed by the state law that would govern that contract. And that will probably be in the choice of law clause, which I'll get to in the next slide. So those arguments are still available when you're making a contractual argument. But if you're, ma if you're saying that state law means that the plan has to do something, that argument couldn't be used. Only federal law applies. Medicaid is federal and state. It's a federal program, but it's administered by the states. So there's federal and state law that applies to both. And again, if it's managed Medicaid, there will be contractual state law arguments as well. ERISA plans, this is the vast majority of employer-backed healthcare plans are covered by the federal ERISA law. Uh, similar to Medicare, it has very heavy federal preemption. So pretty much you're just using federal law unless there's a contract, in which case state contractual law can be imported. 
And then individual marketplace plans, you know, the individual, the, the marketplaces were established. Uh, the ones I'm talking about are the ones established by the ACA. But again, those were established by federal law and are administered generally by states. So in which case you have federal and state law that applies. So the choice of law clause, this is when you're dealing with a contractual relationship. And pretty much every contract between uh, the types of businesses we're talking about, payers and providers, is going to have a choice of law clause. It might be called a governing law clause or something like that. It will generally be labeled. Uh, but it determines which state's laws apply for the purposes of contractual arguments. It's usually somewhere near the end of the contract with other miscellaneous terms. Now, it's important that, again, I'll get to this later on, that some understanding, some ability to determine if there is a contractual relationship and uh, what state law applies to that contractual relationship, that that be known or be able to be found by the people uh, accessing your legal arguments. Because if you're a multi-jurisdiction provider, you know, if you have, uh, you have hospitals in several states, if you're making a contractual argument, the, the one that's valid will be the one that applies to that, uh, that contract. So if you're in one state and the violation happens in another state, the contractual argument will still be on whichever state's laws applies to your contract. Uh, so that's important. The Regardless of where what jurisdiction it happens in, if you're dealing with contractual relationship, state contract law arguments would be controlled by this choice of law clause. And finally, location of treatment. This is most often important when you're dealing with a non-contracted relationship. Uh, so this is about the physical location of where the treating hospital is. So again, this is most important when you're dealing with a multi-jurisdiction uh, hospital, you know, that covers more than one state. Uh, importantly, again, so this is where the physical hospital is. It is not the business headquarters of the hospital system. It's where it's a physical location of the actual hospital where the treatment occurred. So this is, again, this determines what state's law apply for non-contractual arguments. Uh, regulatory, statutory, and especially common law arguments. Okay, so let's get into some examples. Now there are, uh, I'm gonna be using very specific examples uh, for, these, for these various argument examples. There are certainly a lot more than these, but these are just examples of the types of arguments that you might use. Uh, so here's one that, uh, so this is a regulatory argument. This specifically is CMS guidelines. This is a guidance that deals with Medicare Advantage. Uh, and this language says, uh, CMS guidelines are clear that if services are approved through an advanced determination of coverage, coverage may not be later denied on the basis of a lack of medical necessity. And then it goes on to list uh, the proof that this patient's medical record indicated the payer gave prior authorization that the facility rendered services uh, only after obtaining prior authorization from the payer. Uh, and then this is a reference to the specific guidance where this comes from. Uh, now I know, Denise, you, we've had some discussion about this particular uh, regulation. Do you have anything you want to add about it? Yeah, um, because I know, um there's going to be people are going to be they're probably answering their questions right now in the in the in the <laughs> questions area um, because this um, there's been a lot of discussion about the use of this particular argument um, about whether the medic the managed Medicare plans um, actually follow this guidance and so what I've heard from the community is in some pockets of the U.S. there's been a lot of success in in um, arguing back to uh, the managed Medicare plans that um, prior authorization was obtained and then um, because of this regulation you cannot go back later and deny based on lack of medical necessity and then I've heard um, a lot of folks who've said they've, they've used this argument and have not been successful so um, Bill and I have been talking about this kind of back and forth and what his interpretation is and, and kind of, you know, how I feel about it. And um, Bill was saying, you know, sometimes you have to, um, 
sometimes you have to take it through a court system and, and allow a court to kind of, you know, make a decision on whether or not, you know, what this actually means. It's just, it's a little unfortunate, um, in my opinion, that this can't be clear or can't, you know, that not all of our managed Medicare payers, to, you know, read this and take it at face value or, or abide by it in the way that a lot of us believe, you know, uh, what the meaning of it is, is that if you prior off uh, services that you can't come back later and deny it. So I just want to throw that in there. I don't really want to get off track from um, Bill's presentation. This is just an example that he happened to select. And I'm like, well, this is, I'm glad you selected this example because there's a lot of discussion going on around this particular this particular one. So I just wanted to kind of throw out my two cents of how I feel about this particular yeah. regulation, but I don't think there's anything wrong with putting it in your appeal, put it in your appeal letter. It may, they may ignore it. They may abide by it. Uh, but if you really want to uh, kind of force management, force manage Medicare's hand, I think you have to go above and beyond putting it in your appeal letter and complain to um, your local Medicare, um, uh, representatives and and probably do some other things outside um, the appeals process in order to get uh, managed Medicare to actually um, abide by this particular regulation so that's kind of what I that's kind of my little piece on that yeah and I agree I agree with all of that it's it's not entirely clear that there's been uh, an authoritative ruling uh, either by a higher level of Medicare or by a court system on what this means nationally. Uh, but that does mean it's still a valid argument. Until there is a clear higher authority saying, no, that's not what it means. It means this other thing. This is a valid argument, and you can, and it's a good example of a regulatory argument. Uh, so here's an example of a statutory argument. This actually references uh, several statutes. Uh, this is language that uses EMTALA, uh, which as a reference mainly for uh, talking about the responsibility of hospitals and then references federal law that requires coverage for emergency services. So just to be clear, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with the language of EMTALA, EMTALA is a, is a statute that regulates hospitals, not insurers, and requires them to provide a certain amount of uh, you know, medical screening and uh, care for medical emergency medical services regardless of the existence of insurance uh, but we mainly use it because it is the source of a lot of language around the coverage of medical care and then we reference at the bottom uh, other statutes that do regulate insurance companies and say that they must provide uh, emergency care coverage for uh, medically necessary emergency services, uh, and they must provide it regardless of authorization. So again, this is an example argument. Uh, it's also a bit truncated. Uh, the the actual, uh, the full language for this type of argument would be a bit larger and would include uh, references uh, also to some uh, additional statutes depending on the jurisdiction and probably also some regulations. Uh, pretty much Every single type of plan in the United States has some law or some regulation that says medically necessary services must be covered. I have not encountered a situation where the where some law wouldn't apply for that. I have encountered states where they don't have such a law, but even in that case, uh, federal laws would apply. So again, this is an example here for uh, coverage of emergency medical services where a, where a statutory argument is being used. Okay, so here's an example of a contractual argument, and this one is more complex. And I wanted to use this one because I wanted to be clear that sometimes a deeper analysis um, of the facts needs to be done to make an argument. Uh, and I'll go into that a little more when I talk about how you match these arguments, but that also some of these arguments, they're somewhat subjective. Uh, and you shouldn't be afraid of that because the law actually includes a significant amount of subjectivity in the arguments made. Uh, and just like you shouldn't be afraid to accuse people of doing illegal things, 
because trust me, insurance companies do not hesitate to say that payers do or that providers do illegal things. Uh, you also shouldn't hesitate to take what seems like a a subjective standard and uh, interpret it in your favor when you're making an argument. So this is a contractual argument based on what's called the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing. This exists in some form, in, again, in every jurisdiction. It implies into every contract that there is a duty, meaning a term of good faith and fair dealing. So it does not need to be in the specific language of the contract. The law assumes it is there. Uh, and this, for example, is the, the Tennessee example. This references uh, case law that backs up this as an implied term in all contracts. Uh, and this is the idea that it is a violation of the contract uh, for a payer to not act in good faith when they are carrying out the terms of the contract. Specifically here, right after the, uh, the sentence bolded, they have a duty to act honestly and fairly when determining whether medical services pr uh, procedures rendered are covered. And they must exercise ordinary care and diligence when investigating claims. So again, that specific language of what good faith and fair dealing means is going to vary by jurisdiction, but it is going to mean the same thing. If the payer is not being fair, if they're not being honest, that is a violation of your contract. Now, again, I'll get to the details of how you know they're doing that later. But again, just be aware that this is an example of a contractual argument and specifically an argument based on an implied term. So I just wanted to, before we go on to the next one, um, just direct everyone to, um, I did on our Adam website post back in May of 2022 under latest industry news, there's a story about a, a lady who had back surgery, spinal surgery, and she sued under an ERISA plan and she sued the payer. Um, and Bill has looked at it and said, it's, it's a little bit different than, it is a good faith and fair dealing type of issue, um, but it was, it's a little bit different than what we deal with because of the patient actually brought the suit. Um, and then the, uh, legally it was a little bit different um, uh, argument there, but um, I would just, if you haven't read that, I would just encourage you to go and read that on our website. I thought it was a, um, it was a really go good um, case where, that shows how a payer did not have a full medical record even when they made their decision to deny coverage for her. They did it based off of a medical record that was not complete. They made no effort to try to get a complete medical record. They just denied it. And then when they did get a complete medical record, they, they uh, ignored some facts in there that actually um, was in the patient's favor. But don't just read my three or four paragraph summary on it. Actually click on the uh, read here button and go read the actual um, decision that came out from the circuit court. Not only is it a very interesting read, I thought it was very interesting um, about how reviews and audits and decisions are made by um, payers, but it's also this, this uh, judge who wrote the um, decision pulls no punches in how they feel about how the payer um, acted in this particular case. And it's so anyway, I just encourage you to read. It's very interesting reading and kind of eye opening. Yeah, I also encourage reading that case, particularly read the facts of the case, because if those facts were the same, uh, a provider could bring, I think, a very similar argument, uh, this type of argument to that sort of case. In that particular case, the legal arguments were different because of the different parties involved. That was from a patient, and it was a patient who wasn't the primary beneficiary of the plan. Uh, they were, so they, they didn't have the direct contract. It was an employer-backed plan. So the woman's husband was the actual holder of the plan. Uh, and the legal issue there was about the abuse of discretion of a trustee. Uh, but that's one that's still a contractual relationship. Uh, and again, those are those facts I strongly encourage people to read because they were, uh, I think, quite egregious. 
And they show a good example of if you find those types of facts, that would, I believe, give rise to this sort of argument, a violation of good faith and fair dealing. Oops. Okay. So here's an argument example for common law. And this one uh, I use, this is from Tennessee again, but this is the common law doctrine of unjust enrichment. Uh, and this just explains that uh, it is unjust for the payer to retain the benefit of you know, the, the provider services without payment, according to Tennessee law. And that gives the Tennessee definition of what unjust enrichment is. Again, this is something that is universal in the United States, but every jurisdiction has its own particular definition and particular wording as to what unjust enrichment is. Um, also important to know is that a lot of common law doctrines, particularly ones that are pertinent to the types of claims you're making, many of them would only be available in a non-contracted relationship. A lot of these types of arguments like unjust enrichment are replaced by a contractual relationship and they're not available. Instead, you make contractual arguments. This, is, this would be that type of argument. So given that probably rather confusing statement, then you might want to know, how do I know how to match legal arguments to the appropriate circumstances? There seems to be a lot to think about. And again, I'm not an attorney. How do you do that? And by I, I mean you, I obviously am an attorney. Uh, so uh, this is done by making sure uh, you look at the facts of the record and those point you to the correct legal argument. Uh, and let me re reiterate very strongly this the second bullet point here. Well-crafted legal arguments for use in clinical appeals have a factual basis that allows non-attorneys to search the record for the appropriate facts to match them to the argument. That's very important. You can't do any old legal argument. Of course, I went to law school for three years, actually four years, because it was night school. Uh, most of the time it's three years. But, you know, I, you know, are you then qualified just because like these legal arguments could be used by anybody? No, but the idea is to make sure that the arguments being used are simple enough that uh, they have, that the, the things that point to them are clear factual indications that can be used, uh, that can be found by a non-attorney, particularly one who is in this case qualified to read a medical record and a full claim record. Uh, and that those facts can then point you to the correct legal argument. Uh, that way you don't need an attorney to be sitting over your shoulder. You probably do need one involved in the development of the language. Again, I'll get to that at the end and maybe in the training, but once that's done, it should be as simple as searching the record and probably you're looking at more than just the medical record. You might also be looking at patient counting notes, billing records, uh, other claim records. So if you're further along in the claim at, you know, whatever, maybe level two, you might also have to look back at the, the level one appeal or the initial claim records as well for, for some of these arguments. But you're looking for facts and facts that uh, your staff should be perfectly qualified to find. And let's give some examples of this. So what's the factual connection between the regulatory argument we made. So again, the regulation involved there was a medical advantage regulation about approval through advanced coverage determinations. So that's the key here, approval approved through an advanced determination of coverage. So was there a prior authorization? You know, it, so of course, first off, is this the right type of plan? Uh, but if it is, was there prior authorization? That's all you need to know. Did you find a fact indicating prior authorization? Then you can use the argument, done. That it does not take an attorney to find that fact. As long as somebody who's competent to read the record can find that fact, that's all that needs to be done. They find it, if it's there, use the argument. If it's not, move on. Statutory argument. Again, this was a longer argument, but it's actually very simple. This is about the mandatory coverage of emergency services. So what matters? were emergency services provided. That's it, that's all you need to know. If emergency services were provided, uh, 
and you think there's a valid claim, then boom, then you can use this argument. You know, again, it said, uh, I believe the argument was about medically necessary emergency services. So of course, you're not going to make a claim if you believe they weren't medically necessary. But if you're making a claim and there are emergency services involved, you can use this argument. So the contractual argument, as I said, was one I picked intentionally to be more complicated. And this is one that I think seems a lot more complicated than it is, because you see language like act honestly and fairly, exercise ordinary care and diligence. And the and because you know these are legal arguments, I think there is, uh, an, a, there is a mental thing where you might overcomplicate that by trying to think, well, I don't know what lawyers would think honestly and fairly means. I don't know what lawyers would think ordinary care and diligence would mean. You don't need to worry about that. You know what honesty is. You know what ordinary care and diligence is in reviewing a medical record. Uh, your staff is going to know that. They're qualified to assess that. Again, this is a factual determination. The argument is legal, but this is a factual determination. Did the payer, uh, in this case, not exercise ordinary care and diligence when investigating the claim? Uh, again, so you look at the record. So here's a good example. Have you ever gotten a response from a payer who denies a claim and you or one of your staff go back to the record and they look at it and they think, how could they possibly have come to this conclusion? That doesn't make any sense. This, this, and this show clearly they should have found coverage. If you've ever done that, then you've done this analysis because that is what the analysis is. You know, if, and is it somewhat subjective? Yes, yes it is. As I said earlier, that is intentional. It is a perfectly valid argument to take a more a subjective view backed up by evidence from the record that you think the payer was not acting honestly when they came to this decision, that they weren't exercising ordinary care and diligence when they came to this decision. So this requires uh, a, a more holistic analysis of the record, uh, but it's still perfectly valid. And again, I give it as an example, not to be afraid of this type of more subjective type of argument. Uh, it's perfectly valid. And I think it happens a great deal. I mean, honestly, how often do you think the insurance company, you know, didn't act honestly in a denial? I'm willing to bet that comes up, a, you know, a significant amount. So let's move on. Common law. So again, this one is also very broadly applicable. Uh, unjust enrichment. So again, it is unjust for the payer to retain the benefit of the provider's service without payment. Uh, again, this is the type of argument that can only be done in non-contracted situations, so there has to be no contract. And then the payer denied medically necessary services. If they did that, they retained a benefit because you gave service to one of their members, that benefits them, and they didn't pay you for it. That's unjust enrichment. So again, this is very broadly applicable. Was there no contract? Did they deny medically necessary services? You can use this argument. This is the type of clear, uh, clear factual indications that you want for most of these arguments. Uh, again, the, the good faith and fair dealing one is more complicated, but I honestly don't think that, uh, I, I don't think it is intuitively more complicated for people who are trained in, meeting re in reading medical records you know when someone's acting honestly and fairly. And for this, you would know, are, did they deny medically necessary services? Again, if yes, use this argument. So let's look at a particular case. Uh, in this case, Bob Smith, who is absolutely a real person and not someone I made up while uh, creating this, uh, this presentation. So here's the facts of Bob Smith, a uh, 40 year old male, medical history uh, as quadriplegic from a gunshot wound. Uh, I, let's be clear, I uh, do not have enough experience with medical terms to pronounce that next part adequately, so I'm not gonna try. Uh, he presented to the provider uh, via EMS on the date. Uh, his suprapubic catheter was accidentally dislodged. Vital signs are, are as they are. There was abnormal laboratory work. 
Uh, please forgive me if I'm leaving out stuff. You're like screaming at me right now because you think I'm leaving out very important information. I'm, I'm just an attorney. Uh, so treatment in the emergency department included IV fluids, uh, medications. Mr. Smith's presentation was consistent with acute urinary tract infection with sepsis. A sepsis workup was initiated. Uh, continuing on, he was admitted. Uh, there was the treatment plan during his hospitalization. Uh, the fluids and medications were continued. His heart rate eventually improved. Uh, by March 5th, there was no growth in the blood cultures. I don't know how to interpret that urine culture part. I'm not, again, not going to try. Uh, the PICC line was removed. Mr. Smith was discharged home on oral uh, medication for seven days. So essentially he came in with uh, sepsis due to acute uh, urinary tract infection. Pretty sick, but he got better and then was discharged home. So they did everything that you know we would expect um, would occur during a patient who presents like that. But yeah, pretty sick patient. Right. So, and here are the last facts. So prior Prior authorization was not sought. Um, this came in through an emergency department, so that legally isn't required. Uh, medical. This is a Medicare Advantage plan with a contracted payer. Uh, the denial was for medical necessity, and an objective clinical review supports the idea that an honest review would not have resulted in a denial. So what do we do with this? Okay, so what arguments are we looking at? So we're looking at federal jurisdiction because this is a Medicare Advantage plan. So most of the laws and regulations are gonna be looking at are federal. Uh, but we can use state contractual arguments because we do have a contracted relationship with the payer. So what about the regulatory example we use? We're limiting this entirely to the examples that I gave earlier in the presentation. So that was a Medicare Advantage regulation, but that was about having prior authorization and delay or denial. It doesn't apply here. There was no prior authorization, so we can't use that argument. How about the statutory example? That was about emergency services. These are emergency services, so we can use the argument. And again, that's all you need to know. These are emergency services, then we can use this argument. How about the contractual argument? Again, uh, reviewing the case, it was decided the payer's review wasn't honest. We do have a contract, so we can use that argument. And then the common law example uh, doesn't apply because we do have a contracted payer. The common law example I gave would only apply in a non-contracted situation, so we can't use that argument. So we've looked at the evidence, we've looked at the arguments. We can use the statutory argument, which was about coverage of emergency services, and we can use contra the contractual argument about good faith and fair dealing in contract. So development, like you want to do this, you think it's a great idea, how do you actually go about developing uh, these types of legal arguments? Uh, so I regret to tell you that you do have to include attorneys uh, in this. Now, nobody likes to do that, uh, but you do have to consult with attorneys, either your own inter internal attorneys or perhaps external attorneys you go to uh, for this specific issue. Um, and they can help you develop legal language uh, that can be used in these types of appeals. But remember, you want the type of language that has a factual basis accessible to non-attorneys. That is going to limit the number of arguments available, um, but if you're, this is going to be used by a large number of non-attorneys, you don't want a huge number of arguments. That would make it completely unwieldy. Uh, and quite frankly, they're, you know, most legal arguments, a lot of them, are going to require some level of legal analysis, uh, and you know that's that's just not going to be accessible. I don't expect any of you to go to law school to be able to appeal these claims or use these arguments. Believe me, you don't want to do that. Uh, but then, okay, so you get the arguments, you've done the the uh, the work of consulting with attorneys, developing this language. Uh, so how do you actually implement? Uh, the training of this sort of thing. Uh, again, you're going to want to have an attorney involved in that. They don't necessarily need to be the person 
who does the training directly, but they're going to need to be involved in developing the training at a minimum uh, because they need to make sure that the that the correct uh, factual basis that there's a, that there's a correct understanding of what you're looking for and what you're arguing. Uh, there does uh, we think there does need to be an initial an initial live training. Uh, that is important because there's a lot of information to get across initially. And also, I think the initial live training can help put a lot of people at ease because, again, you're. Hold on. I apologize. There was a uh, an issue on my end briefly. So you want an initial live training uh, because. Again, there's a lot of information to come across, and there will this will be a good way to put at ease people who have discomfort at the idea of using legal arguments. Again, you know, you're not an attorney. The staffing is they're not going to be attorneys. There's going to be some discomfort at using legal arguments. Part of the training is honestly to put people at ease, to let people know, look, if you use the wrong legal argument, you're not going to be sued. No, the police aren't going to come after you. It's going to be fine. Uh, and then you want to develop, after that initial training, you want to develop some type of guide or crosswalk to be a reference for the staff. Uh, because, well, give, you know, given time, I'm sure they'll pick up on the, the facts they need to look for, the things they need to think about in jurisdiction. But that is going to take time, and they're going to need to work through it themselves. And so you have a reference guide or a crosswalk so that when they you know, every time they hit that issue, they can go to that reference and say, okay, so this is my issue. What am I looking for? And they can look it up. And again, it doesn't need to be terribly complicated because again, the, the facts, the facts should be very direct in connection and the jurisdiction issues should be very clear as long as they have access to all of the information, which means they need to know, they need to have access to the knowledge of, is this contracted or non-contracted? what type of plan it is. Those are things they need to know. If they have that information, then they should be able to go to this reference and make those determinations. Uh, and then the team that was uh, developing this should remain available afterwards for more complex questions. There's always gonna be marginal cases that aren't directly or not directly enough uh, referenced by the crosswalk or the guidance no such thing is perfect. There's always going to be outliers. So people should be available to answer more complex questions when they come up by the staff so that they can get the answer. And then the next time it comes up, you know, hopefully the staff will then know how to, how to deal with that particular situation. Nope. Okay. So again, what should you take away from this? Uh, including legal arguments in your clinical appeals makes your appeal stronger. It makes them more likely to succeed. Uh, as I said, it also telegraphs to the payer, you know, what your expectation is, not just your knowledge, but also your expectation of the laws and regulations and, you know, contractual responsibilities they have to follow. Uh, Again, broadly speaking, the legal arguments that are applicable here are broken down into regulatory, statutory, contractual, and common law arguments. Uh, that the proper jurisdiction of a legal argument, and this is an important part of these types of arguments, is determined by the patient's plan, choice of law clause in a contract, or the, and sometimes the physical location of treatment. And then legal arguments are matched to claims by examining the facts of the record. So there we go. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate you listening to my presentation. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. I think that was really good. I love listening to Bill. He's um, just a wealth of knowledge. And we're right up on the hour, so we're going to skip the Q&A today. Um, I haven't actually looked at the questions list, but what we'll do as we've been doing with our other webinars is we will post um, answers to your questions um, on our website along with the recording of the um, webinar today so that you can get your questions answered. Um, so look for that. That usually comes in a couple of weeks. It takes us a little while to get through all the questions and, and get the, the questions and get the uh, develop answers and get those posted. But thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Bill, for presenting today. 
this, I think, um, don't let this scare you. Um, if you're a clinician, it is not that complex. Um, as, as Bill has, you know, tried to reassure you all the way through, it's not that complex. And I do think it is something that we need to be doing in our appeal work. Um, and so I hope that you will take advantage of what you learned today as a starting point and get started with doing your own, um, uh, creating your own uh, legal arguments that could go, go in your clinical appeals. Okay. Thanks everyone for attending and we will see you again in September, no webinar in August, um, but we'll see you back here in September. Um, have a great week. Thank you everybody. Thank you, Bill.